Oh, okay. <coughs> okay.
Thank you for being here. Glad you're here. I think we've got more than we've had in a long while. We're in First Peter, if you're here for the first time with us. Uh, and let me get this back on. Let me read the text, then we'll talk about where we have gone and where we're going. I will say something before I go any further. One of the advantages of this live streaming is that I can replay and realize areas where maybe I didn't emphasize as well as I wanted to. So I'm going to do that <coughs> on a point that I know you know, but I just wanted to show you something. But we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, Galen, would you read for us 1 Peter 1, 22 through 25 that we've been on for several weeks for quite a while because there's so many topics in that section. But if you'd read that, please. Okay, so what we've discussed thus far is, and this is really about, is there anything stable in this unstable world? We haven't been talking about that, emphasizing that each time, but this is what we're talking about now. So we've talked about staying pure. You know, now that you have purified yourselves by how? By ob obedience to the truth, so... Something that can stay stable in our lives is this right here. It's staying pure, being obedient, loving, remembering you were born, remembering you were born again. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply with all your hearts, for you have been born again. <coughs> and we were talking about being born again. And every time that comes up, you know, one of the, one of the issues that comes up out of that is this issue of is this issue of baptism? You know, baptism. And I, you know, <coughs> it, it. I'm sorry. It's it's an issue, really. Uh, if you really want to get the ac ac most accurate translation of baptism, it would be immersion. Okay, we know that the immersion, immersion for the forgiveness of sins. We understand that. And you know, I presented this to you last week, and I want to show you some things. We talked about this, born again, of water in the Spirit. Is there water in the plan connected to the gospel? For you have been born again, not a perishable seed, but have been perishable through the living and enduring word of God. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can, be, can enter the kingdom of God. We didn't talk about that last week, but this is an important aspect of this. When you're, when you're born again, you enter into the kingdom of God. In Hebrews 12, and other passages tell us that it's the heavenly kingdom. It's the kingdom that will never perish. It's the unshakable kingdom. I love that statement in Hebrews 12 about that. Uh, unless he's born of water and the spirit, which I believe is, is, is baptism. It's immersion and then the gift of the spirit. And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, immersed, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Not, and some people want to say because of the forgiveness of sins. That, that little word right there, ace, it can mean for. Uh, you know, for the forgiveness of your sins. But it, it, for, it can mean because of, but I don't know about if, if, in his book, Muscle and Shovel, that someone are familiar with, the author tells us that that little word ace is never translated that way in any of the New Testament passages is for the forgiveness of sins. You're not going to be saved, not going to have forgiveness of sins until there's baptism. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But right before that, as you know, Peter had preached gospel. He had preached the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm just saying we can't disconnect from that. That's all I'm trying to, that's one thing I'm trying to say. Let's not talk about baptism and disconnect it from gospel. We've got to preach gospel and then response to the gospel. That's, that's absolutely imperative. But <coughs> baptism has continued to be an issue, as you know, people being baptized. And we were reading from Titus 3, and I wanted to, I wanted to go over something one more time in Titus 3, 5, B, and 6, this passage right here. 
He saved us through the washing of rebirth. I think that's the baptism. Rise and wash away your sins, Paul was told to do. Saul at the time. <clears throat> and renewed by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. And I, in replaying it from what we did last week, the study last week, I put this uh, visual up here, but just did it for just about a few seconds. I want to concentrate on it just a little bit longer. <laughs> Titus 3, 7. So that, having been justified by His grace. That's what I really wanted to, you to understand in this whole study from Titus 3. Justified by His grace. We might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. I read that with Gene Stout by giving him a saying, you want to take this book, you've got to either accept it or receive it. When you're being baptized, what's happened is you're reaching out and you're receiving the gift of salvation. So when people say to you, if you teach the baptism is essential for salvation, you're taking away the gift status. No, I'm not. No, you're not. Every person here that's been baptized, that's in this room, I think it's probably everybody that's here, you were, you were receiving a gift. You were being saved by mercy. You were being saved, saved by grace. You were being saved by the cross. You were being saved by the resurrection. You were being saved by your obedience. And all of it, you put under the umbrella of the gift. And I'm going to talk about that in the sermon Sunday, this morning about <coughs> the incomparable riches of God's grace. Uh, the gift that's just, you can't, even, you can't even begin to hardly measure the depths of it. So that's, that's what I was trying to say to you. And then finally in Titus 3.8, when Titus is through with this section, <clears throat> he says, this is a trustworthy saying, and I want to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God, and any time you do anything, whether it's initial obedience, whether it's living the moral life that we should live, husband and wife relationships, parent-child relationships, Anything that God commands us to do, we're trusting in God, that's the way we should live. When you were baptized, you were trusting, weren't you? That when you did that, your sins would be washed away. Were you not trusting in God? Were you not trusting in the promise? And when he said, you'll receive the gift of the Spirit, which I'll, that's going to be uh, the gist of the sermon this Sunday t- tonight. Uh, or you're not trusting. So everything I'm doing, if I could sum up, well, how do you, if somebody were to say to me, Ray, how would you sum up the Christian life? Well, there's a lot of passages I could go to as summation passages, but I could say it is trusting in God. It's trusting God for my salvation. It's trusting God for my sanctification. It's trusting in God for my relationship of all relationships, how to live in relationship. It's a total trust. And be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. And that's all I was saying. I, I realized when I had done that. And also, I came across an old visual I'd used back when we had the overhead. Uh, some more passages on this idea of baptism. And I know I'm speaking to those of you who are very experienced with this. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? Now, let's go over to Acts 8. Let's go to Acts 8. And you know this fact, but I just want to remind you of it. When you're just, when, if you're using this as an illustration, if you're, if you're studying with someone, part of what I try to do is to, is to try to uh, equip you. And of course, he's reading from the scriptures. He's reading Isaiah 53, a portion of Isaiah 53. And, and he says, who's he talking about? And he preaches to him Christ. And so in verse 36, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? Why shouldn't I be immersed? So they just stood on the bank of the river and he just dumped a little water on the top of his head. Took a cup of water, dipped that in, and just put it on top of his head, right? Is that what it says? No, it doesn't. There's something, I think there's something to this. In the order of the chair to stop, then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized them. When they come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and you did, you know, they go down and they come back up. Okay. Uh, I like the way that the uh, you'll visualize Bible study series. <laughs> They've got some updates on this. Look, look at this. This is up over here. Baptized into his death. He was buried. Buried with him through baptism. In this frame. Buried together, freed from sin. That's what you did. And all of it's by grace, and all of it's by trust, and all of it's by belief. You know, I hear these, these guys that say we're saved by faith alone and confession alone and the scripture alone and grace alone. And I want to pause and say, well, tell me which one it is. Which one is it? 
It's all of that. Now, if I could put an umbrella over all that, I would say it's by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. That just some, Paul didn't have to stop every time, and Jesus didn't have to stop every time and say, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. So that's, that's what I was trying to emphasize in that. Okay, now, as we come back, let's come back to the text in, in 1 Peter. Go back to 1 Peter. And he talks about all these things that they were supposed to be doing. Uh, they stayed pure. They were, they were staying pure. All, all of that. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply with all your hearts, for you have been born again. Now, how have they been born again? Not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the wild flower. The grass withers, the flower falls, the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. So if you look over here on this whiteboard over here, you can uh, how is it? Therefore, therefore, and then he'll say, then he'll say this. Let me show you this. Therefore, there, therefore, he'll say, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, put pockets and all that. So when you see the word therefore, you ask yourself, what's it therefore? Therefore refers to something that has gone before that. So therefore, one, because you purified yourself by obeying the truth, you, you now have, uh, you've purified yourself by obeying the truth. You have a sincere love for the brothers. You've been born again. And how have you been born again? By this word of God. Therefore, now, there's going to be a new kind of lifestyle, which we'll talk about over here, 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3. And it'll be get rid of certain things and crave. And it'll be about, do you want to be childlike or childish, like newborn babies? Do you want to be mature or immature, grow up or immature? Do you want to be spiritually healthy or sick? Do you want to have purity or impurity in your life? And that's what 2, 1 through 3 is going to be. But I'm going to back up for just a moment and look at this idea of the Word of God. It's the imperishable, this Word, this, this Bible that you're reading, that you're looking at. It's imperishable. It is living and it is enduring. This part right here, people talk about really, really need relevant sermons and classes. That's right. But where do we go to get that? Where would the preacher get his inspiration to do that? The Bible. Is the Bible relevant? Okay, let me be the devil's advocate. Look, it was written a long time ago. Y'all sing a song called Ancient Words. Sure, it's so ancient. It is so ancient. What's relevant about the Bible for 2020? Tell me. Everything. Oh, come on. Don't cough out on me. Give me some specifics. I'm being the devil's advocate right now. Okay, tell me. Okay, God's worst never ending, but here I am. I'm struggling with economics. I'm struggling with the pandemic. I'm struggling with uh, human relationships. I'm having a hard time in this life and ups and downs. And, and uh, you're telling me that the Bible is relevant? Everything in it? Well, that's still not very specific. It doesn't change? Okay, that's great. It's not, it's not helping me everyday life. How's it helping me? We're being taught by God. Now, that's a good one. That's the first relevant word I've heard. Okay. Now what else? What else? What's, what's the use of this book? What does that mean? What does that mean? Okay. Okay, it tells God's truth. Now, there's a person giving me a lot of relevant material right there, a long list right there. Anything else? Any way else that's relevant? Helpful? We have a Savior? Okay, that's Okay, has a Savior that does what for you? What does this Savior do for you from this, from this book? What does it tell you he does for you? Down on the cross. Okay. Do what? Okay, can't, uh, hope, hope, okay. Oh, you believe you actually have hope? What kind of hope do you have, ma'am? <laughs> Janet. <laughs> hope of eternal life. Wow, that's a, that's a relevant one, okay. 
This is it right here, okay? Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You can go to this book to find out that? Okay, you sure can. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's go to Second Timothy. Second Timothy three. I'll quit being devil's advocate now, okay. Quit I'm gonna quit play playing the part. Second Timothy three sixteen. You know this one very well. You know what sixteen says. And this is Paul to Timothy. He's already said to him, the scriptures will make you wise unto salvation. So that's one of the most practical aspects of this you could ever read about. Salvation. And all scripture, not some of the scripture, all scripture is God-breathed or inspired of God. Whatever translation you have, I think God-breathed is the, the more literal translation. And I'm just going to pause right here. It's useful. All scripture, all of this Bible, all of it, every, all 66 books of the Bible are useful and the and I went through and I tried to find all the other translations and these are the two main words that are used to try useful and I'm going to tell you that the living word of God the imperishable living and enduring word of God it is useful it is beneficial it is practical it can be applied to your everyday life I think it's the greatest handbook on human relationships that's ever been written there's not a better book how to get along in husband wife relationships parent child People you work with, people out in the community, Robert. Ray, I think, I think you need to go to Second Peter. Okay. Well, you do it. You do it. Right. I think we put sometimes we put too much emphasis on the cross. Because this isn't our home. Our home is with him in heaven. And he paid an ultimate, he paid a, a, a very dear price for that to redeem us back. And that was his son on the cross, which is what you talked about before. And and in the in our Okay. Paul, Paul said that, that he keeps his eyes focused on heaven. And that's where his goal is. That's where his aim is. And look at all the things that Paul suffered. Okay. Look at all the, the, the turmoil that Paul went through to get there. I mean, even the death that he died. Yeah, yeah. He was... Okay, now, now I'm going to bounce off that and ask you something. I'm going to ask all of you this question. But can it be that I can be so heavily minded that I'm of no earthly good? I've got a neighbor that's hurting and they say, I need your help. Yeah, but I'm thinking of heaven. Okay. Okay. So what I should be doing with that neighbor is I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about heaven, but when the neighbor comes knocking and says, I'm hungry, I'm going to go help him. Because I, I am seeking first the kingdom, the rule of God in my life. If I'm seeking the rule of God in my life, I'm going to go to work. I'm going to make a living, love my wife, love my children, grandchildren, all those things. I'm going to take care of the, paying my bills and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to do what God expects me to do. But he also, I think, if I can understand what you're saying, is I can get so wrapped up in this life that I forget heaven, I forget the Lord. I can get so wrapped up in this life, I forget about serving and helping. 
It can happen. It doesn't necessarily mean, I'm not, I don't know if that's true of anybody in this room, but it may be, okay, Galen, did you have a thought? And now go to you, Lonnie. Go to Lonnie, Galen here. Yeah, he was first, yeah. Right. Yeah. Create in Christ Jesus for good works. Say by grace we face not works they mentioned boast. Then created in Christ Jesus for good works. Lonnie. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Well, let me get you. Let me get you. I was going to do some Old Testament studies, but I I want to do this. Go back to the Second Timothy three passage, and I just want to remind you of this. This this imperishable, living, enduring Word of God. And this is the Word that was preached to you. Those people in First Peter that we've talked about. We've shown the map of where where the the preaching was done that Peter's talking about. We're talking about how this is beneficial, practical, applied to everyday life. So in 2 Timothy 3, uh, this, we're, we're told this, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful. It's useful for teaching, or you may have the word doctrine, the body of, of teaching, for rebuking. For rebuking, rebuking is saying, this is wrong, this is sinful, it will condemn you. For correcting, this is how you can get over that. You can have your sins washed away. As a Christian, you can, you can confess your sins to one another. You can then walk in the light, 1 John and James 5. It, it trains you in righteousness so that you can be equipped for every good work. And then he tells Timothy, you preach it in season, out of season. You preach it when they like it, when they don't like it, when it seems to be appropriate, when it seems to be inappropriate. And be prepared in season, out of season. And he says this in, in, in the fourth chapter, going down to verse, what is it, verse 2. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. You put all of those together, and you've got, that's what the Word of God can do to you. It can do all of that for you. It, and and that's, that's speaking in generalities, but everything I've been talking to you about, and you've been talking about in the way of specifics, can come when you hear that kind of preaching. It can be beneficial, it can be practical, it can be applied to your everyday life. Every, everyday life. Um, now, <clears throat> okay, yeah, when well, you go ahead and read that, Let, here, here's, here's what Gator's going to read to you. If we don't preach this and we don't apply this to our lives, if this is not the way, if we're not this open to the Word of God, here's what's going to happen. Go on ahead. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, we'll turn, it'll t- turn his side away from the truth. Let, let me show you something. Let me get you to go to Luke 8. Uh, I think, I think Robert, you know, has been preaching through the, the parables, and I know it's touched on, is preached on this parable right here. But how do I know, how can I tell if I'm open, if I'm, so if I'm open enough to the living Word of God to where it becomes beneficial, practical, how it can be applied to my everyday life? What is the test? How can I know? Well, this parable in Luke 8, the parable of the soils, the parable of the hearts, different things. It's, I, Jesus called it the parable of the soils, and he talks about the farmer and goes in farms and throws out the seed. And there's three, three aspects of that where, the, where, where the, the, the person is not as open and as receptive as they need to be, and they fail. But go down. I want to, for the sake of time, I want to go down, and for the sake of emphasis, verse 15. Luke 8, 15, but the seed on good soil, it'll also be a good heart. Well, this, this is what it says. Stands for those with a noble and good heart. Is the word of God, are you open to it? 
Do you have an open, good heart that you would, you would take the correction, the rebuke, the encouragement, and all of that? We hear we need encouragement. We need the rebuke, the correction, and we need all of it. We need the whole counsel of God, as Paul said to the Ephesians. We need all of it. We need every bit of the Word of God from, from Genesis to Revelation, and particularly the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation. Okay? But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the Word. Now, I think when he's saying here, it's not just... Well, I heard the sermon, I, read, I did my 10 chapters for today, I read it, but it doesn't really sink in. But then retain it, hear the Word of God, and then retain it, and then this. Here's how you can know whether the Word of God is being beneficial, practical, profitable, useful, whatever English words you may want to use that are synonymous to this. Uh, who hear the Word, retain it, and by persevering, produce fruit. And of course, the first fruit we probably think of is the fruit of the Spirit. But let me show you another one. Go to Philippians. Philippians, the first chapter. Philippians, the first chapter. And this is Paul's intercessory prayer for the Christians of Philippi. And if you read Paul's intercessory prayers, it'd be good for all of us to read those prayers. They really, they really are, really are good for us. Philippians 1, beginning of verse 9. And be the kind of prayers we could pray for each other. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness. And in that word righteousness, we've always emphasized that little word, right. Fill with what's right. That comes through Jesus Christ to the glory of and praise of God. I was going to read to you some passages in Psalm 119. Uh, that passage that we read uh, first Sunday night of each new year. And every, every verse in all that lengthy Psalm 119 except for four or five has to do with some expression of the word like commands, laws, precepts. And uh, you know it'll say things like the word of God, the, the law is my counselor. Or your, your precepts comfort me. Or your precepts give me freedom. Or your precepts, your laws, your commands give me the light. And I kept thinking about the truth will set you free. Jesus said, I am the light. <laughs> uh, comfort, uh, God is the God of all comfort. All, all of these passages. Uh, Psalm 119, 111 says, These commands of yours are my joy. We're supposed to be joyful always. Rejoice in the Lord always. So is the Word of God real, real, real practical and relevant? Is it useful? Is it going to do something for you? Um, yes, it will if you're open, if you're open and receptive. If you're open even to the correction, rebuking, but also the encouragement and also the training in righteousness. Do you keep reading it so you can be constantly trained? In re- and if it's even repeat, Peter, Peter did that. He says, I'm going to repeat some things to you even though you know it. And I know I've repeated it here a lot of times. Preachers... All the time are repeating. That's, that's just part of, the, part of the way we do that. So there's, there's the Word of God. I did want to show you something that I think is really interesting about the Word of God. So let, let, me, let me do this. This brings us to this next part. I said we'd, we'd get to the second chapter, <laughs> so we'll introduce it. So therefore, because they've been born again by this imperishable, living and enduring Word of God, he's going to give them some practical things. To remind him. Therefore, we should be renouncing the sinful. Should be renouncing the sinful. Look what he says. When he says in 1 Peter 2, Therefore, because you've received this word, you purified the truth, you're loving the brothers, uh, born again, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy. And I think the best translation right here is envies and slanders of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. So what's supposed to happen? Now that you receive the word, there should be renouncing of the sinful. There should be the craving of the pure spiritual milk. There should be the growing up in your salvation. You should be understanding you have tasted the Lord is good. That's where we'll be concentrating over the next over the next few uh, next few weeks on that imperishable word I did want to share something with you that I think it just shows us the 
of how I, I hope we understand, because we have such easy access to the word, the value of it, that we never that we always feel blessed because we, could just, we just can just get Bible so easily. And I'm going to read to you this most recent Eastern European mission. You may have gotten the mail out about a guy named uh, Gwen Hensley. He was one of the first ones to go in when they had to smuggle Bibles in. And I wanted you to see this. I'm going to zoom this up where you can read it. Uh, it, it, talks, it talks about here how, how he... Uh, well, let me, let me just read it. I think that would be the better thing for me to do. Uh, several weeks ago, Eastern European Mission National Director Gerald Martkin came across Czech secret police archive records indicating that the secret police had put Gwen Hensley on their watch list under the code name Oklahoma on October 28, 1969. As most of you know, in the late 1960s, Gwen visited villages where only one copy of the Bible was found in the entire village. And sometimes it was just a handwritten portion. With tears in his eyes, he said to his wife, Gail, if it's God's will, and I believe it is, I'm going to see that these people get the Bible in their own language. His great faith was evident in the fact that he went forward with total confidence that the Lord would provide Bibles in the hands of many. With these words, we're reminded of the boldness of faith exemplified in the early days when Eastern European mission was smuggling Bibles. In the beginning of this ministry, communism was a common enemy that united many Christians to work together to make sacrifices to provide God's word. Today, we're still united by a common enemy, and his name is Satan. Though the evil one goes to great lengths to steal, kill, and destroy, we are also united by an even greater God who has given us victory over evil, and we go to even greater lengths to bring people to himself. Every story of new life in Christ, from the early days of Eastern European mission with Gwen till today, during a pandemic is a testament of God's faithfulness. We're thankful that God opened Gwen's eyes to the need to provide Bibles, and we pray for God to open our eyes to the need of the harvest. And that's going on. And right now during this pandemic, because we have this live streaming, we're able to just go everywhere. And churches all over our brotherhood are doing this. I don't know how many thousands of people out there are hearing the Word of God. And it is living. It is enduring. But now then, it should, be, it should make a difference in, in the way that we live. And let's go back to this. this. Yes, go ahead, Lonnie. I, I, well, I don't know. You'd have to talk to the other guys that are doing that. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Well, there's very, a lot of those, probably the majority of those are members of the church. But we don't know. We don't know. But there's five different times then this week. But then you multiply that, and, I, and I've, been, I've been going through the whole brotherhood and looking at church after church after church that's doing this live streaming because they, they're limited like we are as far as attendance and all. So they're live streaming because of this technology. And there, there's so many things we can do. But look at this. Go, go to 1 Peter 2, verse 1. Therefore, therefore, rid yourselves of all these things, of everything, that he's talking about. There are some things we just have, we just have to get rid of. Uh, before he even gets to malice, deceit, hypocrisies, envies, and slander, he says, rid yourselves of all of these. And notice he says, all malice, all deceit, uh, and like newborn babies crave the pure spiritual milk. Well, let me get you to go over to Romans 13. Romans 13. I'm going to show you some introductory passages, then we'll get into this more next week because our time's about to run out. Romans 13, look at this. And it's what I call moral, moral balance. <coughs> Romans 13, look at this. Verse 12. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us, you notice this, this expression, put aside the deeds of darkness, and put on the armor of light. In the early church, there are a lot of times the people would put on white robes after they were baptized. They would literally do that. It wasn't a command, that's not a command anywhere, but they would put on white robes and wear those white robes. Uh, there's a movie where these people are moving towards the river, and they're all wearing white robes, and you probably have seen it. And Alison Cross, is that her name? Alice, uh, came come down to the river to pray. It's being sung, and it's a cappella. It's a beautiful scene, and all these people are going down to the river, and they're not being sprinkled, they're being immersed, <laughs> and they're all going down in their white robes. 
But it's interesting how the scriptures will use this, use this definition. Put aside the deeds of darkness. Put on the armor of light. Let's behave decently as in the daytime. Not in orgies and drunkenness and sexual immorality and debauchery. Not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, you know, so he's going back and forth. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Go over to Colossians. Colossians, the third chapter. A big section on this whole concept. Colossians 3. <clears throat> Colossians 3, 1. He says here, Since then you have been raised with Christ. And I think that's a reference to your baptism. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So put to death. Put it off. And he talks about all the things we put to death. Whatever belongs to your earthly self. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, the life you once lived. But now you must, here's that word, rid yourselves of all such things as these. <clears throat> Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy land. Sometimes you want to concentrate on those things he talks about above, but he also brings in all these others. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with this practice. Taken it off <laughs> and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and the image of his creator. Here there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. Christ is, all, is in all, and that's just like other passages that says we're all one in Christ. Everybody has access. Grace is for everybody. Therefore, it's God's chosen people and dearly loved. Clothe yourselves with. <clears throat> and the scripture does speak in negative tones about what we should get rid of. There's a lot of passages about that. It's all over the old, it's all over the new, but it's all over the old and all over the new of the positive things that we need to put on. And when he says clothe, it means this should be your life now. So what do you put on? Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bow with each other. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, <laughs> put on love. It's kind of like this is the outer covering. It just covers them all. Which binds them all together in perfect unity. I love this one. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body you were called to peace, be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and counsel one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And this just kind of, this is one of those summation passages. What's the Christian life about? In whatever you do, rather in word or deed, do it all in the name, by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So, but we'll get into these specifics next week. Thank you. Thank you very much.